Hello. Welcome to day number five of the OCD Game Changers Fireside Chats. Thank you for being here. And thanks again. I love getting your feedback on what's been helpful for you for this. And um, it, the feel that I'm getting from people is that it just feels good to have conversation and to feel like you are part of a conversation of what is going on in this bizarre crisis that we're living through. So my name is Christy Hodges. I am the founder and the executive director of OCD Game Changers. I'm a certified peer support specialist working with individuals worldwide, helping to support them and normalize what they experience with OCD and the emotional turmoil. And I'm also the author of Pure OCD, The Invisible Side of Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Um, and thank you for being here. I've been hosting these all week with some of our big leaders and big names in the OCD community just to try to get everyone's input so we know how we're feeling is justifiable. And as silly as that sounds, I think none of us know how to feel. Natasha Daniels said it the, you know, the best. There is no right way to feel, but sometimes it helps to know that other people feel the same way as you. So I um, want to go ahead and let Aaron um, as Aaron, as I introduced you at Game Changers, I'll say it again. Like when I grow up, I want to be the female version of you because I just love your passion and everything. Um, so it's an honor to have you on as usual. And it's just always good to see you. So tell everybody who you are. My name is Aaron. Um, and I'm a co-founder of Made of Millions and have OCD. And Chrissy promised me cocktail hour today. <laughs> I know. I just took a sip of wine and I was going to say we were going <laughs> to Cheers. Salute. Good to see you. So this is going to be the, this is, you know, the times when you're sitting by the fireside and someone pops out mm. the bourbon and then all of a sudden you're sipping the bottle together and we can't do that because of the coronavirus right now. So no better way to do that than this way. This is true. I actually <laughs> just got out of 40 degree water because my brain needed like a little surfing retreat, a little break from everything. So I, forged the coronavirus fears and went out into cold water and now I'm all, now I think I'm all you warm and happy. Huh? <laughs> you need a fire right now. I really wish we were sitting together and we had a fire in your apartment. I know. <laughs> Controlled, of course. Too bad it's a shitty New York City apartment. <laughs> Um, well, I'm going to let you talk about your feelings on this here in just a second. Um, but for those who just joined us, um, maybe for the first time, I've been advertising these all week. Um, we're not going to be doing fireside chats every single day for the next month because it's it's, it's tiring, even though it's fun. Um, but we are going to continue doing them after this week, especially on spe specific topics that have come up uh, that, that we've myself and whoever has been on have addressed and we feel like we can't address it correctly. So I'm really excited to have more guests on next week. And then, you know what, we're going to do them as long as everybody's stuck in their house. Um, so, you know, look for the schedule next week, but why we're doing these are fireside chats are really meant to have no agenda, just, just authentic conversation between people about specific topics that can cause distress. And, and this is where we're at right now. We're in an Again, unprecedented situation. We don't have a finish line. We don't know how to act half the time. And then it, on top of that, there's a lot of fear mongering. So I specifically wanted to bring in leaders in our community, the OCD community, anxiety community, that can really help us open up dialogue and conversation about how we can support one another during this. Because it's really, really important, especially when you have anxiety and OCD, to be able to to know there's a network of people that understand what you're going through who also are going through it alongside you. So that's what we're doing here today. So thank you for being here. Now, without further ado, Aaron, tell us what is going on with you the last couple of weeks. Like give it to us from day one. And day one would be probably two days after we were together yeah. at Game Changers. That was the last normalcy we all had, right? Yeah. Then y'all all sure. left and the world exploded. <laughs> yeah, it's bizarre. I mean, I'm not sure a lot of people probably aren't aware, but I have my own um, creative agency in New York with uh, a few great partners and um, things are real interesting right now, obviously, because mm -hmm. marketing and design and creative is usually the first to go when it comes to client, you know, business budgets. So even though I'm self-employed, you know, 
agencies only have so much runway with cash and things like that because a lot of the work is project based. So you're constantly just refilling, refilling, refilling the pipeline. So we're very fortunate to be in a good position right now, but obviously there's uncertainty as far as, um, you know, how long will this last and, and what could that potentially mean for the team and the company we've been building and how can we, you know, work to protect those individuals while also protecting our, you know, asset that we've spent a decade, you know, building a reputation around. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to weigh there. Um, just in that space outside of, uh, outside of, um, you know, OCD land. Mm -hmm. That's a scary balance too, Aaron, because you're not only balancing and, you know, if you're watching right now and you're in this position, whether that be an employer or an employee, the balance of thinking about the health of your company and, but also the health of the people that work for you and having to keep that in mind. I imagine that is a really, really tough situation to be yeah. in. I saw, um, I saw a post today that was saying how, when people will interview for their jobs in like three months, they'll ask how the employer handled the coronavirus situation. And then that would be, oh. a, yeah, like a criteria, um, which wow. is a fascinating idea. Right. And, and actually yeah. it, 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 it's fascinating. And, you know, when I put my employer hat on in a way it could be, I, I guess it's just a balancing act, right? Because, is it fair? Are the decisions you're going to make going to be fair to everyone? Are the mm -hmm. decisions you're going to make going to be fair to um, key people? Are the decisions you make going to be fair to yourself or you know the asset that you've built? So you know balancing and weighing all that out in a way that's healthy. I, I mean, I think you know as much radical transparency as you can possibly have is really the only real solution with your teams because no one knows what's going on. I mean, no one has any idea. Right. I think yeah. about like risk and, you know, just being fully transparent. Like even if you run a small business, your your personal liable, you're personally liable no matter what for your loans, for your line of credit, for your office lease. There's no situation where the business is signing the lease or the business is signing a loan. Like you're personally liable yeah. for that. Yeah. So normally that stuff's not on my radar you know, because normally it's like, um, I'm just gonna, um, I'm pretty ADD right now. So I might float around. You might have to rein me back in. But Did you just use ADD as an adjective? ADD, Aaron? Yeah, I know. Failing the community. Everyone, um, Aaron just wanted to give you an example of what not to say. <laughs> I did. We planned I, that. <laughs> I did legit try to take a test an ADD test online and I forgot to finish and I'm like actually true. Real story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have no idea what I was talking about. It doesn't really matter probably, but I, yeah, whatever. Let's move on. <laughs> That's how my brain We can works. talk about strength-based language later, but um, I also do want to preface with this is as Aaron is talking, I was trying to find a function before he got on here of where he could write in like what acronyms are so people could understand what he's talking about. Because when Aaron gets going and talking about business stuff, I, yeah. my face is like this. It's I'm like, okay, what does this mean? What does that mean? So I was hoping like if that happens, I could type it in really quick and it can pop up and be like, this <laughs> is what that means. Yeah. It's basically Aaron's <laughs> full of shit. And here's no, no, it's not F O S. <laughs> um, tell us emotionally though, like, Business wise, yes, but emotionally wise, what has been your experience in, in like not even in the OCD realm, we can go down that later, but like, how have you processed all that? What has it been like for you? Uh, I mean, um, being in New York, I see Jessica's in New York as well. Um, it's a, it's a bizarre situation. Like I live on sixth street. I can look down on the street right now and it's, it's empty, you know, there's no, there's really? part of, there's parking, there's no cars. Like, um, it's super weird and eerie. It's eerie. And also everything that you love about New York is gone. There's no culture. There's no connection with people. There's no cocktail hour drink after, um, you know, team outing. There's no, 
music, entertainment, restaurants. Like, so when you rip all that out, you actually realize like the city has, is just a pile, it literally is actually just a pile of concrete. Um, when you take everything away that it offers, that's sort of like human, there's no nature, there's no nothing. I mean, like, yes, I went surfing in Rockaway today and it's pretty disgusting and cold, but you can, you can experience nature. Um, so that's been really interesting, just like looking around. And then the other thing is like being forced to be on video chat all day. Like I, st I wake up at like eight or like whatever. I probably start work around like eight and I work super late right now because we have to do grind super hard, get stuff done, make sure we're delivering top, top, top a game or like one little thing you can be out. So I'm literally staring at panels of people's faces all day, right? All day, oh. every day. Literally, I mean, when I say all day, I mean, back to back to back to back to back to back to back. Maybe I have 15 minutes, maybe to walk downstairs. So sitting in this chair in this spot on this screen, yeah. it's, it's definitely taking a toll. This is super, super grumpy. Mm -hmm. I'm grumpy. I'm grumpy about it, Chrissy. Well, and even though you're you're in front of a screen with, and we've talked about this a lot this week and just kind of touched on it, but even though you're in front of people maybe you're working with all the time or, or clients of yours or just people in general, there's the real loss of human connection. There's the real, and one thing that I saw today in an article what, that was scary for me was talking about, I love that you just brought that up. I, I wrote it down about how when you're, when you're uh, interviewing, that's one of the things that's going to change here. But also I read this article today talking about things that were going to change. And one of it was, okay, most things are going to go online now and people are going to find it um, more beneficial to meet over video. And I felt my chest cave in. I was like, I mean, Aaron, you know this, I don't necessarily like people that much anyway, <laughs> and I, just in general. And I certainly don't like hordes of people together. I get anxiety, but um, <laughs> the loss you know, th there is something though that helps me feel grounded in the ability to be able to, as silly as it sounds, to go to, you know, the sprouts that I love here and see the same checkers and talk with them while I'm sitting there or even bump into the people on the trail or bump into here and talk and, and see my best friends here. And so it just is scary to me that people are really thinking, okay, well, this is going to monumentally change the way we interact with humanity. You know what this is? What is that movie? What's the movie with the robot? Um, um where they go up in space. Um, it'll come to me. In space. Hmm. Uh, it'll, um, Wally, Wally. Yeah. I, I think Steve and I talked about it the other day too. Wally. The, Aaron, seriously. OMG. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna say like Black Mirror, or some dystopian future <laughs> thing. Wally, it's it's. And I think Stephen and I like mentioned it briefly. It's about like how humans become so reliant upon technology, and all hell breaks loose down here on Earth. So they have to go up in the spaceship in the sky, and everybody lives there, and they're all like, no one can walk because they they've become like so. Yeah. Anyway, watch it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing else to do right now. So, you know, I don't, what? I don't feel like you made a super compelling sell, but at this point, I may as well. This is why I'm not in marketing, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wild. I mean, you know, unfortunately, a couple, um, it, it's kind of hitting in a lot of different ways, right? It's hitting, sure, it can hit in your OCD land, it can hit in, um, you know, your, if you're employed somewhere or if you're an employer. Uh, and also, you know, being in New York, like, uh, one of my partner's, um, uh, parents is very sick. I see you coronavirus. Um, d her dad is also sick and you've just got a situation where people, you know, are actually, you know, sedated, unconscious, intubated, and simultaneously, you know, they're trying to balance, the downturn of the economy and downturn of the business and also um also you know being real about them needing to spend as much time as physically possible with their family so there's a lot of things to juggle for for a lot of people right. and i'm i feel i mean i'm right in the middle of it all but i think ocd in particular is something that has 
help me navigate these like business for me is is I don't want to say it's easy, it's difficult, obviously, but business is e comes easy to me because the risks the risk. aren't really there for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to lose my company. I don't want to lose the opportunities. I don't want to lose what I built for 10 years. I'd love to sell it one day, like all these things. But that's not, as we were talking about, like that's not as scary as wondering if you're a murderer or mm -hmm. you're going to kill someone or you're going to hurt a kid or you're going to do this or that. So in a lot of ways, I've been able to take more risks with business and the nonprofit and things like that because they just, the risks just don't feel as big to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, the, the risk of the loss, I guess I can relate to you on this, on this realm. Um, I can 100% identify with the entrepreneur spirit mainly because I know what it's like to be at the absolute rock bottom. When you know what it, when you literally stare death in the face and are like, I'd rather die than continue to feel this way. Yeah. Um, when you don't know you have OCD and you don't know there's treatment and all the shit that goes along with that. Um, taking risk and falling to the bottom of like economically can feel a lot. It's like a trampoline <laughs> versus like the yeah. rock bottom, which is complete hell, you know, with coals everywhere and whatever. And so it's um, that's that's where I got the. Uh, I, I remember this is interesting the way the this is kind of turning out. Um, I I got to a point in my life where I could not just be comfortable in um, I don't want to say monotony, like um, for something to be boring. I'm not happy. I don't feel inspired. I don't feel creative. I don't feel alive. Yeah. And so throughout my life, you know, we're normal, not normal, but most people take the path of Oh, I'm going to get a job and I'm going to, you know, do this career and nine to five and stuff. I just had no tolerance for that if I wasn't enjoying things. And I think a lot of that comes from my experience with OCD. 100%. Totally agree. It has helped when things like this happen. You know, like I mentioned yesterday, Sean, my husband, you know, is, is furloughed for weeks and weeks and weeks without pay. We have no idea if, if and when that will ever. And it's kind even, of like. I don't even know what that means. What does furloughed mean? So furloughed means. Um, we're going, you're going to, you are mandatory time off. So you can be furloughed, furloughed. Unpaid. Unpaid time off. It depends. You can be furloughed with pay or furloughed without. And I think what you were talking about earlier by asking that question when you're hiring, you know, and everybody should ask for this person who laid him off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. This, like he's not paying any of his employees and he has the money to do it. So, well, I mean, that's the thing, himself. right? Like, I've had already had calls with clients and obviously to be careful, but if I call the clients that are very financially fine, but they're going to hack out a small business and that's going to cost, you know, someone a job potentially at some point and um, maybe it won't, right? But just the economies of scale are totally in play here, right? If you're a billionaire, uh, you're still you're a billionaire, you're a billion dollar company, you're still chopping all costs at all costs. Mm -hmm. Um and that's falling squarely on on the earner. Um you know, like I, I think we we you look at how ninety nine percent compared to the one percent, it always feels like it's present, but it feels a little intangible to people. But what I'm wondering with this whole coronavirus situation is if it's going to make that feel much more real in the sense that I already that feel it. Do you feel it? I see it. Totally. If you've got, you know, being, being in, you know, Lower East Side of Manhattan, we've got housing projects and yuppies and we've got everything in between. And you can already feel like people vanishing off to their Greenwich house or their Hampton thing or whatever it is. And no matter what their general needs are met, right? Like I'm in a position where I'm fortunate where my company could get chipped at maybe like a peel it like an onion. Well, like I'm still in the onion. I'm still somewhat protected. And when you think of the average person who's living paycheck to paycheck who can barely make those bills and then you want to actually rely on the fucking government to actually try to give you some kind of like relief in the form of like cash in your pocket 
to actually be able to make a transaction, to feed your family, to pay this, to pay that, right? And then you think about the fact that like, sure, there could be a regulation that says, oh, we're gonna do this with rent or we're gonna do this with whatever, but there's also enforcing the regulation, right? You still have right. the Jared Kushner companies of the world that are you know, grinding old women out of their apartments because they're in rent controlled because they wanna flip them into uh, you know, multi thousand square foot uh, per square foot, you know, luxury condos. So like, it, it, it's to me, it seems like if this goes on for a little while, it's going to be a lot of have nots against a very few haves. And I think it could get very, very, very ugly, very ugly looting yeah. and riots and other things, especially in big, big urban markets where where you I was can really, say, New York, can, I don't think that people are going to be rioting here in Palmer Lake. <laughs> I think where you can feel the disparity. I mean, if, if you've got people dying, you know, if, if, a, if rich people, white people can get tested for uh, a coronavirus very, fairly simply, but then you've got people um, who can't, it's, you're going to start to see the, that disparity of access and privilege in a way that threatens, you know, someone's safety, someone's viability as a person. Mm -hmm. And that could go down a very, um, a very negative path. I, I, I think that to a certain degree, uh, I, and I expressed this to you before we even came on here is just kind of being dumbfounded at the way that people are reacting to this. Or I, for me, I'm already seeing it. I'm already seeing this humongous divide in between the people that are going to be okay. And, you know, I, at this point, and I was just saying about Sean, I think we're going to be all right. You know, I'm lucky I can work from home. I'm lucky, you know, X, Y, and Z. But the, so I feel part of that. But I also see, I also have worked with and, you know, still work with people who are not going to be so lucky. And that's the scary part. And, and what, what's going to happen with that? How are we going to bridge that? Or is it going to be bridged or is it going to stay that way? That's the scary part of all of this. Yeah, totally. And how many, I don't know. I'm very concerned about people's basic needs not being met. Like I haven't gotten totally into the whole bill of everything that they're trying to pass right now, but it does seem to me like, sure, they're, they'll put a little cash in someone's pocket in the next three weeks. But I don't think that's enough to sustain a super long-term, super long-term problem mm -hmm. that this might actually be, in which case, what do you do when your needs aren't being met, when you can't pay certain things, right? Or put put yourself in the position of a small business like mine. I have really high rent in New York. Like we have a nice office on Broadway and it's, it is what it is. It's New York rent. And there's no way that my landlord is going to do anything other than squeeze every possible scenario out of that with my name attached to it on a lease that lasts another two years. So that's putting me liable personally for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and just because even if the government says like, oh, something with rent, it doesn't mean that that guy's going to actually do it that way. It doesn't mean I'm not going to end up in court if I have to get out of that lease in some way. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. So, I don't know. It's a lot of uncertainty. But as you know, anticipatory anxiety is a waste of everyone's time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, right? John, I, I do think, though, that that's why people with OCD and I've been seeing this. I don't know if you're seeing this in your community, um, you know, on your social media and stuff with it. But what I've been seeing is is really the resiliency that people are experiencing with OCD. I think raising the points that we're talking about today are super important because economically, every single person is going to be impacted. Every single person or every single person is going to make be making decisions because of how they're impacted, whether it's 1% yeah. or the 99%, either way. Right. However, what I want to emphasize, and while you were talking, I was thinking about this, is in all of our experiences with OCD, and I think I've, I may have said this before, that when you get hit with the first symptoms of OCD as far back as you can remember, or if it's just been recently, it is world changing, upside down turning everything. And you don't have the luxury of going onto social media and being like, oh, my God, the world is effed up because of coronavirus and expressing all that and having the whole world understand it because the whole world is experiencing it with you. Yeah. So all of a right. sudden you're put in this position 
to stare in the mirror at someone you don't recognize because now you have no idea where these thoughts have come from. You have no idea who you are anymore. And you have to be like, put on a damn face and smile so nobody knows. And Wait. how many years do we do that before we literally break? And what frustrates me the most is, and, and I don't mean this as a way because I think people don't know better. But the, the people that I work with and myself and you and, and the advocates, you know, we lived with this uncertainty, this this uh, wanting to die because of our symptoms were so bad at, at times. And all the while, most of us put on a happy face. We compensated with whatever we needed to do. So people thought that everything was all right. And we didn't lose our shit every five minutes on Facebook, shaming and dragging everybody else down with us. Mm -hmm. And so my, not my disappointment, but maybe more of my mind blown moments have been how resilient our people are. I mean, for real, like to the point of we learned really quickly and we adapted, you know, we're, we're, we adapt. And, and rise above and persevere. Yeah, all of us have had mental breakdowns. I mean, that's just part of the game with OCD and anxiety. Um, but just a general degree of understanding from a social perspective, like, I don't know how to, how to, how to maintain that uncertainty. Uh, so I don't know. That's been my experience. And that's been, that's my thoughts. And as you were talking, I was thinking about that and how our community, we, we're almost lucky. I don't want to say lucky because I don't want to put that in a light like that, but we're almost lucky that we had the training for it. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I think it's the difference of like, these things are happening to me, which isn't as scary as I could do this thing to someone else, or I could create this scenario that would, you know, it's a personal responsibility versus like, like you said, um, on a trampoline, I can hit the bottom and bounce up, you know, I, I, it's, it's very, um, very much in a way kind of like surfing for me because um, you're out there and you don't have control of any situation. You just have to like, you know, use your, your knowledge and, and your technique and whatever else to... Yeah navigate it but everything that's happening is all around you right you're even if you're getting beat down and you're getting held down for a long time like today i mean it wasn't big waves or, uh, or anything but just still you know the water when it's 40 degrees and you're in a ton of rubber and you're underwater doing a flip or two um just learn to just be super chill because it's just happening around you but it's much more scary when you think that you might be capable of doing something that's interesting. I need to digest that actually. Um, Cause I've never, I've, I didn't really think about it that way. It's the, this is happening to me versus this is what I could be capable of or things could change in a moment and I could snap and something could happen. Yeah. I mean, my control right, versus so much scarier. every single day things are changing and it's out of our control. But it's, you know, we're just able to kind of roll with the punches, kind of like in surfing of like, yeah. okay, well, I already know that this water is going to be like this, you know, but I'll, so I'll just adapt. Right. Adaptation. That's the word of the day. Adaptation. I'm writing that down. Very weird film too. Adaptation. I don't know if you saw that one. No, I haven't. What is it? There you go. That's your weird, weird art film you can watch. You watch Wally. -E, I'll watch Adaptation. Okay. How about that? We'll Done. report back. <laughs> Done. Yeah, no, but I think that's such a it's such a big distinction. And when things have been you're afraid of your sort of like, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are plenty of things where like like right now I have major problems with um I keep calling them skin peelers, which is funny because that's my brain interpretation of what's happening is you know, people or myself as being skinned alive, but like any type of peeler uh, is just really a- Like a potato peeler? Yeah, I mean, any okay. of that is very, very difficult, very difficult. 
I can get rather. Oh angry. wait, you're having yeah. thoughts about peelers? Yeah, very difficult to be around. You get can get actually get very angry, very oh. like can't do those right now. Um, but, you know, but whatever. It's one of a thousand things. It just happens to be the thing right now. Well, thank you for putting that in my brain. So I can think about it later tonight, Aaron. You know what it is? It's like, if you can just imagine it just going a little bit deeper and just- So take, anyway, back to what flesh. we were talking about earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you now pre-expose yourself to- It's so beautiful out right now. It's sunny. I just saw a bird. <laughs> I think a squirrel just went by. Yeah. <laughs> Practicing well, mindfulness. <laughs> Um, anyway, I do want to ask, um, so, you know, Made of Millions is your new platform. I've been seeing a lot of your stuff streaming and that's so exciting. I saw Ben Ruvo, um, Rovu, oh shit, did I, um, I may have just pronounced his name wrong, but um, Open open Mind Gym, sorry. I'm sorry, Ben, if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, anyway, I saw his stuff. I think it's awesome, but I wanted to ask you, um, I know you're busy anyway, but I'm sure that like your that project is you know you're checking in and stuff. Have you seen what it, what is your community? How are they responding to all of this? What do you see in that? And I know it's encompassing a lot of different um, mental health stuff, so it's not just OCD, but in general, what what's the consensus? Is it the same with the OCD community as other mental health community? I mean, I think everyone can re resonate with the the uncertainty idea. I actually, uh, I don't want to say OCD isn't a thing. Um, Wait, also, I wanted to. OCD isn't a thing. I, I don't want to say that, but uh, oh, what what I am, but what I am going to say is that um, where I've kind of morphed my own personal understanding, my personal experience of things is that um, someone can have, someone can be anxious about going and meeting their significant others parents and it's a healthy normal anxiety right someone could be so anxious though that they refuse to meet them and maybe that starts to get in the way of their life a little bit right or someone could be so uh uncertain about what how they'll be perceived in a presentation that they decide not to present and that actually negatively affects their career because yeah. they didn't take the chance to go and do that and then you go up kind of a level and you're sort of like, so, well, someone maybe uh, is so anxious socially that they kind of withdraw and they don't go to certain outings or work outings or happy hours or whatever it might be. Um, so these things, they start to impede, right? They start to like avoidance or they ruminate about, uh, I can't go to that or this will happen. And then you just kind of keep going up that ladder. And maybe if you've had trauma, sexual trauma, violence, PTSD, whatever, um, you know, maybe that is a, is something that that experience is a reason for you to avoid something or is a trigger for you. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you've had just psychological trauma with upset, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder, just sort of like bombarding your brains with thing that can become such a, um, such a, uh, a, a negative stimulus that it forces you to avoid things and maybe have all kinds of other compulsions. Um, so I really don't, like, sure, we, we categorize things, we put them in buckets, and I think that's important that we mm -hmm. do that so that we try to understand where things sit. We try to um, identify an evidence-based solution that may work to help to provide. I know where you're going with this. I know. Yeah. But generally, it's sort of this <laughs> spectrum of anxiety, right? And, yeah. and this general bucket of anxiety is largely around one thing, trying to stamp out uncertainty is really what it is. We cannot accept uh, uncertainty, um, especially in our little OCD class. We have to try to stamp it all out. And um, I don't know where I was going with this point, but uh, <laughs> you were talking about made a millions, whatever. So I think yes! like, yeah. How so your, think, how's your community doing? Yeah, so my point is that regard, yeah, regardless of, um, <laughs> regardless of, uh, whether these people are OCD people or whatever, like it's an anxious time and uncertainty is the is the thread that weaves through all of it. And people's level of reaction to that could be healthy and normal, or it could be um, you know avoiding things, or it could be being anxious 24 hours a day, or it could be 
um, you know, compulsive related behaviors around it, um, around contamination or harm OCD or fear of harming um, people with germs or potentially spreading the outcome right, uh, right, or, or potentially course. harming the parents. So like, Manifesting all, symptoms because, and then worrying that you have it and then not wanting to see people that you might kill. A hundred percent. Right. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I mean oh, like, that's like super common, right? Super yeah. common. Oh, absolutely. E even if you're a virgin, you think that you have an STD or something, right? Yes. Yeah, so everyone, yes. Has a, everyone has an OCD. So if you're uh, a virgin and you're worried you raped someone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're pregnant. <laughs> Uh, exactly. By the way, we're allowed and to laugh about this shit. By like being yeah. on the toilet and you think mm -hmm. you got your mom pregnant. Hundred percent. All the things that make sense so when the, you have OCD. Yes. <laughs> and you should laugh about. Um, but yeah, so I'd say, like, generally speaking, even though we've kind of broadened the community, which strategically we feel is important, um, yeah. at the same time, we've. Uh, you know, seen everyone sort of anxiety being this just general bucket of, of uncertainty. And that's something that, to your point earlier, is a major attribute. If you've had any level of coping and navigation of, of how to handle your OCD, and maybe you've experienced a little bit of cognitive therapy or a little bit of exposure therapy or mindfulness or things like that, you definitely have a leg up for the situation that we're in, yeah. which is interesting. I agree. Yeah. I, um, can I bring the topic to something that is so not planned? Yeah. Um, I didn't know that we planned anything. Also, um, I see, there's a few New Yorkers in here. And then Sydney, Australia. And there's Felice. Sydney. She's like, I'm thinking about peelers now. Yeah, she is. And I'm alone now. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. We're supposed to be talking coronavirus, but. Because this is an authentic conversation, let's just go. Let's okay. go with it. So, um, Aaron and I have talked on and off about this for several months. Uh -oh. And then you just mentioned it, though. So, I'm only wow. bringing it up to you. Um, let's talk about trauma. Okay, let's do it. We have 15 minutes or so. I'm fine like, with that. Yeah. And, and I, you know, can I, can, I tell this, can I tell a story? Yeah. Okay. Oh my God, I just broke my desk. Um, so I didn't break it, it just moved. Um, I'm gonna tell you a, a quick story before we get into this. Okay. So I, I have been struggling for a long time and um, I got some therapy, EMDR therapy for trauma, for stuff from my childhood and into my teenage years and just life in general. Um, and it was phenomenal. Really, and I haven't it, tried it. it it's, it was, so wonderful and it helped so much, but I didn't target anything that had to do with OCD. Okay. And so a few months ago, I found myself, no, a year and a half ago, I found myself completely stuck, read the book. Um, the body keeps the score life changed dramatically. I all of a sudden realized that I have experienced trauma. Whereas before I didn't think I deserved the title of experiencing yeah. trauma. Yeah. And it, me a very, very, very long time to accept that and to think that it was okay as an advocate to still suffer and struggle because I felt like a fraud. And then last year in the fall, I started feeling really awful and I, I got married and there was all this OCD shit around that and just OCD in general I was dealing with. And I felt like I was passively suicidal a lot. Mainly like if I were to drive to the store and got run over by a train, I wouldn't care. I mean, that's mm -hmm. passive suicidality, right? And so I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know how to address it and I didn't know how to ask for help. And I certainly didn't think that I deserved to ask for help because I was someone that was out there trying to promote hope. Mm -hmm. Right. And then I went to the UK and was still feeling horrible and I hated London and that didn't make anything better because London, everybody looks at you. They don't acknowledge you. They're not nice there. Sorry, Londoners, if you're listening, but it's true. Oh. You would, if you were listening now and you saw me on the streets and you smiled, I would feel differently. <laughs> Did you stop to ask directions or anything? What? Did you stop to ask directions? Were they nice? I mean, yeah. Even when I was like at hotels checking in and stuff, like people really wouldn't even look at me or like, oh. 
like, hey, and then I get back to New Jersey and I come up to the counter and I'm all like, mm, I hate everybody. And they're like, oh, girl, how was your trip? Where did you go? And I was like, see, people are nice. It's just London. So anyway, <laughs> I go and see Aaron Harvey in New yeah, York. Did. I remember that. And we had a really good time mm -hmm. hanging out. And remember, like, it was the sauce and I thought it was like raw and that was bloody and I didn't want to eat it. And I asked you to take a bite first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And it was just beet sauce. <laughs> anyway. It was so, beet sauce, but it looked like blood. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I don't I need to eat this in front of Aaron, but I don't want to eat it. I'm gonna make him eat it first. <laughs> anyway, so we had this really great conversation about just not feeling good and how it's okay. And the trauma that surrounds living with OCD and how it just feels to not process that trauma or not even be talking about it and how there's a lack of information and resources for people after they get treatment and they fall in this hole of I'm alone. I, I haven't grieved all this. Right. I mean, you remember this, right? Yeah. I, mean, I hope you do because it was life changing for me because if you did not I would feel terrible. <laughs> I mean, maybe just sad. Um, anyway, so I left and I went home and it was the first time I ever felt human again, like if in a long time. So, A, thank you for that. Wait, so that being, was our conversation that did that. Okay. So thank you for being open and vulnerable to talk about that hard topic. I'm like glossing over a lot of the stuff we talked about because you remember. I think it started with the fact that we both didn't want to be drinking. And then I think we each had a bottle of wine. I know. And now we're having a happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly neither one of us have changed, but whatever. <laughs> um, but either way, um, what I realized out of that was that out of that conversation that A, I was not alone because you could validate everything I felt and, and B, like how freeing that felt for me. I could feel like I could be an advocate again and I had worth because you felt that way and you were being an advocate and had worth. And so I, I want to just thank you for that. I don't know how much you know that that changed me. Um, but B, it also opened up my eyes. A, how to relate to my clients. I'm an ABC person. A, how to relate to my <laughs> clients better. Because once I identified that experience for myself, like OCD is traumatic. But it's not just OCD. It's all the things you lose because of OCD. It's the person you think you could be if you didn't have OCD. The person that you lost, like the innocence that you lost because of OCD. The, the treatment of OCD, I'm just going to say it. Like ERP can be traumatic. You know, I, I had a, luckily had a therapist that did not traumatize me. But when I think back, some of the memories of the things I had to do felt traumatizing. And then the loneliness after of just being like, okay, now I'll go live life. Yay, you're better. And I didn't feel better. I mm -hmm. felt like I didn't belong on the planet. So all those things, that conversation opened up all that for me. So I could show up better for the people that I support and also open up dialogue for people that this is an important topic for us to talk about in our community the trauma that we experience that just gets glossed over because you've gotten the RP and now you're better. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot there, but I think, I know, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, but it's, it's true. So one, of course, there's always imposter syndrome for yeah. anyone, oh, yeah. for anyone, especially for an advocate. Cause what does that even mean? People are, whatever um but then there's uh the idea that we have to kind of find that balance between selling the magic pill which is hope or hope through erp or something like that and then um the reality of like what day-to-day -day is once you sort of figure that out and then i also think there's probably different variations of um Intensity, I imagine if you're, and I have no idea, I can't really speak to this, uh, or I can't speak to this at all. I can only speak to my experience. 
I think if you spend a cu couple of decades in your head, you know, there's a certain degradation of your self worth Absolutely. that happens during that time frame. And maybe, or hopefully if you're not that you don't have that same problem, but hopefully if you're 13 or something, you're getting an early intervention that maybe you're realizing that your brain's just like cha 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 and that it has nothing to do with your self worth. Um, I imagine that's very difficult. It'd be a great conversation to have with a 15 year old who, you know, had been through that Good for idea. a few years. We should talk to, um, it's a great idea. Talk to the kids movie. Um, Chris Bear. Yeah. Chris Bear and, and, mm -hmm. and his crew about that. But um, yeah, so there's a lot there. And I think um, it's interesting because one of my validations for why we actually moved from intrusivethoughts.org to Meta Millions as just a, as, as, as a more integrated hub is because I felt like if you're only talking about OCD, then ERP is a great construct to sort of break the cycle of obsession and compulsion because you're just challenging what it is at its core and you're breaking the cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I use that every day, more or less. Like right. I have some weird thing that pops in my head and I just double down, triple down, quadruple down until I just stop worrying about it or thinking about it. Um, so I think that's a very, it's just a tool. It's a fucking tactic. It's not rocket science. It's a very mm -hmm. basic concept. In, in, in a way, it's almost as, gr as, as grotesquely simple as Little Johnny is afraid to swim, so daddy throws him in the deep end. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, sure, and then the ERP therapist would be like, well, actually, no, we put on the water wings, and then we have them dip their hand in the pool. No, and then we have mean, them imagine things yes. going in the deep end. And then then we put their feet over the edge, and then we're like, so, okay, right, but this isn't fucking rocket science. This is very basic But that's concept. kind of the point, too, is, sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make yeah. this point while it's in my head, is, I that was one of the sticking points for me as like the rush of grief and trauma the moment that I found out oh all I have to do is this so I almost died because all I had to do was stop arguing with my brain it was that easy like why didn't someone know why didn't I tell someone why didn't I have someone in my life I could tell why didn't you you know what i mean like that's for people what's so hard i think sometimes is finding out the solution is simple and i don't want to negate that erp is really hard but the simple behavioral solution is don't argue back like mm -hmm. don't don't engage and it will die down you know mm -hmm. as, as complex and miserable and grinally it can be <laughs> grinally you, you know, had to that, work it in. You had to I mean, it that in. could be awful and miserable, but at the same time, that moment of I cannot effing believe this is it. This so is I, I never had that moment. I never had that moment where this is the solution. I, I think. Well, it didn't stop then, but it was right. a realization of like, oh, and then I was just pissed. So, I mean, that's interesting because I think the point is that that type of therapy is not supposed to treat, it's not there to treat depression or guilt or all the things that come from these experiences that we have. So that's where it's so important to be thinking about comorbidity and other treatments and things of that nature, which is why we have to stop looking at OCD like as just this isolated bucket in our communities, it's important from an identity perspective. It's important from a, hey, this obsession compulsion thing can be broken by creating a level, like an intervention, like an ERP intervention, where you can just challenge yourself and try to not do the, do the compulsion and build your skills and build your tools. Like that's all super important for that behavior. It's like a behavioral intervention, but for the actual grief, with the trauma, yeah, the healing the, from it, the healing, and yes. and of course there's like 100%. the lost relationships, or there's the the people who don't start families because they're afraid they're going to hurt the child if they have one, or the child is going to actually be the psychopathic um, manifestation of what they almost are. You know, yeah. these are all things that I've experienced, right? So, mm -hmm. um, or the lost know. the lost milestones, 
you know, you think back on the day you graduated or the day you got married or the day you, you know, the first time you started your dream job or whatever else we have in our heads of the milestones. And all we can think about was, am I attracted to the person sitting next to me or why am I keep thinking about fucking my dad or what, <laughs> my dog or whatever else? Like, you know, those memories get burned in our brains about what we were worried about whether it's murdering someone or that we're, you know, attracted to Jesus. <laughs> That's horrible. Um, and it's, you know, you, you think about like looking back through, and this is one of the things like you think about looking back through photos of like poignant memories of when I was a teenager, I can look back on those photos and know exactly how I felt just by looking at my face. You know, my OCD face was like, yeah. <laughs> like while everybody very... else was smiling, you can see it in my face, like going, Am I gay? Am I gay? Am I gay? Am I gay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It I mean, sucks. It's uh it's very sad. So that's why these things can't be they can't be isolated, they can't be treated separately, they can't be discussed separately. Um that's why I, I couldn't do a particular advocacy assignment because that assignment was to only speak about OCD and nothing else. And I was like, I can't do that. That doesn't make sense. Why would I do that? That's not my experience. So, um, so I think it's about treating the whole person and the whole experience. And there's a lot of nuance to that. And that's something that sh there should be a rise of conversation around uh, there. I think there's even a doctor on our board who uh, thinks the word trauma is being thrown around a little too lightly in the OCD community. And I welcome that perspective. I'm fine with hearing that perspective. I, I don't, I disagree. Mm -hmm. I totally challenge that perspective. I think that if I have a intrusive thought, if you will, um, it's so immersive that I'm there. It's not like I'm, it's not like I'm here, like I'm there, I'm in it. It's a deep, deep dream state almost in many cases. So it, it may as well be real, right? Or what about the fact like if you wake up in the morning and your brain is doing something with a knife and then you go out into the street and you walk to work and then there's a jackhammer or something else happening or there's a kid or there's this or that or you FaceTime your nephew or like whatever, there's a thousand things that happen, you know, throughout a day. And then you go to sleep at night and then you wake up gasping for air. I mean, I probably wake up at least once a month. When I say gasping, I mean like, I just think, I, ha I wonder how long it had been since I had taken a breath. Yeah. Um, and it's usually a situation where I have done something. One of these things that I always imagine that maybe I would do, that I've done something and in many cases, I don't even know what it was. I just know that it happened and that I've lost my freedom. That's actually usually what the recurring dream is around is the feeling mm -hmm. of losing that freedom. Yep. Yeah, so whether that's in court or that's, you know, hiding a body or <laughs> whatever it is. Um, yeah. So, you know, these things, they follow you 24 seven and ERP is not a solution to being followed and haunted and badgered 24 seven. It's a great tool, it's very powerful. I recommend people use it and learn it and deploy it. And I deploy it all the time um, because it's one of many, but it's not, uh, it's not full stop and it doesn't look at the whole person with respect to what OCD ravages in, 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 the, in its wake, you know? Mm -hmm. That was really beautifully put, thank you. Was it? Well, ravages in his wake. That's, that's <laughs> quote worthy. I'm going to write it down. Um, I've been writing down quotes always. Um, uh, no, I I appreciate that perspective and the dream stuff. It's the same with me. It's the oh, same with a lot of people. So who wants to go to sleep and have to worry about the same shit? <laughs> I know. Sean says all the time that I wake up and I'm like freaking out and like it's because I'm not breathing and I'm screaming about something. Yeah. And so and it's it's, it's really. typically high stress times, high times when I'm like the most worried about stuff that's been on my head. Um, I disagree with the trauma piece too. I do yeah. think the word trauma can get thrown around, but so can the word depression and so can the word all that. But yeah. um, 
any purist, any any purist is someone who should be challenged because there's no purist, there's no purism, if you will. There's no there's no definition. There's no fucking dictionary. There's no there's evidence. There's not fact on any particular situation pertaining to the brain. And even if there were, that doesn't take into account personal experience. Yeah, of course not. Yeah, emotion, right. worldview. I mean. The deeply, deeply held things that we have had since, you know, you and I were kids yeah. that just continued to build and build and silence kept those things, kept those things way down there that are now probably as a 43 year old coming out in my life. And the, the, the idea that I could actually embrace that label of being traumatized was freeing. Yeah, I think and it's really nobody funny. can take that away from me. Whether no, or not they so believe fair. it is, or whether it's not, I don't care because it was healing to know that it was okay that I experienced all of this stuff in the 20 years after I got treated successfully up until now, where my life came to a screeching halt physically, emotionally, addiction wise, everything. I was a screeching halt. And it wasn't until I found out. It's probably because you you carry so much trauma around, nothing in your body can move. You are living in like the eight year old, the eight year old still trapped in there somewhere. And I yeah. had to free. Yeah, and I, I think that's the other part of this that we haven't even mentioned, which is equally and and maybe the most I would, I would personally say the most horrifying, which is if you have learned to dismiss your thoughts as not being your own then you have no idea who you are oh yes okay so you said this at game changers by the way <laughs> and yeah, i like the darkest a thing. People, oh my god does that mean that my thoughts mean that i am who i and, and i wanted to clarify because when you said that i got like this chill because i knew exactly what you were talking about and so um just to clarify this is how i'm interpreting what you're saying and i a hundred percent agree with this. What that means is we are taught by having OCD that the thoughts, you know, that the thoughts are meaningless, that the themes don't matter, that this and this. And, and so we are then put and programmed almost that when we have these thoughts, this isn't not in a compulsive way that this is OCD and this isn't me. That's not what I mean at all. But what that does is almost like existentially, well, then who are we if I can't trust my thoughts and I don't even know at that point who to embrace or who I am? That's what I'm taking from it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's what you mean, but I 100 percent agree. And that also is scary. And I think a lot of people go through that. They feel disconnected from who they are after finding out this is OCD. Not that they were enjoying the fact that they may have been a murderer or a rapist or a pedophile or whatever at all but then to find out oh by the way you can't trust your thoughts but everything's okay because see there's a yeah. way to deal with that and then move on with life and everything will be okay yeah i mean I, in many I ways it's very counter to to a lot of people's upbringing because that in many different ways but um if you're I understand the premise that if you have an unhealthy relationship with a certain thought pattern, that you should set it aside so that you can have a healthy relationship with it in the future once you learn some skills to be able to do that. So a case in point would be something like religion, right? Um, if you have an unhealthy relationship with it, set it aside in theory, right? And then um, learn what is unhealthy about your relationship with it so that you can achieve a more healthy uh, balance, right? Mm -hmm. But in, on paper, that sounds great, right? But, you know, say if it's religion, then there's the pressing th idea that you're probably going to die. Like if you get hit by a car, this happens or this happens or whatever, like in that moment, if you die and your brain isn't in the right space or your soul isn't in the right space, whatever, then, you know, you're dead forever, or you're in hell, mm -hmm. whatever it is. So for a lot of people, and I hear this a lot from the community, it's a really scary concept. Sure. I think if it's something like, 
um, and, and I'm not in any way intending to diminish or demean any type of theme, but I think there are some themes that ERP works better for. Um, I think if I have an irrational fear that is clearly irrational to me as an individual, um, and ERP helps me overcome that irrational fear, I can get behind that, right? Like my relationship with knives has changed and gotten a lot better. I can, I don't cook, but I can cut an but apple. But when we're talking about moral, like talking about messing it, with destiny, messing with whether or not you're going to molest children. Relationships, I think. Relationships. Yeah. Um, religion, existentialism, all that stuff. ERP is not a great solution for in my personal experience. And I've been very, I would say, very saturated in those air, in those buckets as well as very saturated in harm and a, a lot of buckets. But um, so I, I have at least my own personal experience, which is like some buckets are easier to tackle with ERP, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, yeah. yeah, but others are just absolutely not. Um, and they, they give you that, they take you to that place where then you end up sort of saying like, well, okay, if I'm not, I'm now on the other side of it. And if I'm not a pedophilic rapist, murderer, racist, blah, 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 whatever horrific thing that you think you are, psychopathic, blah. Um, and I'm also not, you know, going to go down these paths of unhealthy conversations with relationships or religion or anything existential. Well, then who the fuck are you? Cause you just spent like 20 years doing that. Mm -hmm. So like, what are you? So trying to read, trying to discover who you are, like after wading through yeah. your interests of thoughts. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know if I, I'd ever actually getting around to like really writing a substantial piece, like a longer form thing. But that is how I viewed my last five years is sort of, uh, well, what? I don't know. I guess it's been five years or so, maybe six, since I found out I had OCD. Uh, four years as of like a week or so ago of doing nonprofit work. Um, I forget that it's been just such a short amount of time for you. Yeah. And with no, I haven't like, as soon as I figured out and I got like, I wouldn't say well, but I kind of figured out enough to share information. I've been in advocacy land for better or worse. Um, but yeah, so. You know, the way I look at it is Aaron. And what I've discovered in doing peer support with people is just, there's just no, there's no wrong way to address how we're feeling in recovery because recovery it there you know there is no finish line as much as some people want to tout that there is for majority of people there's no finish line i get here it's all gone everything's good and life's back to normal because that's a trauma changes us b ocd changes us and adaptation is part of what we do best and that resiliency but and what I can say is in my recovery since I was treated for it, it's been over 20 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I continue to jump over hurdles. See, that sucks because I don't want to hear that. It does. It's been six years. Okay, but let me yeah. tell you something first. Why are you crushing okay? my dreams? Hold, hold, or I break out a peeler. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I would never do that. Um, I also lived for 13 years in silence after treatment, not telling anybody. I only started advocacy when I, I'm not giving you reassurance, but um, I didn't start advocacy until about seven or eight years ago. And so for many, many years, I lived in silence. And that's who I'm trying to target here and talking about that. The people who go from this huge crisis to now you're better. And then it's like, get away from me. I want nothing to do with OCD. And they go and try to live a life that's like, okay, now I can get back to focus on who I should be mm -hmm. when that is still here. You know what I'm saying? And I experienced that for years and years and years after. And then advocacy came along and that's when I, it was like almost the acceptance piece of it. 
And yeah, and I think advocacy is weird because like you, you, I think the reality of people with OCD is they fill all their time, they fill their whole fucking calendar with just like staying busy and doing things to stay out of their head. <laughs> and like if there's any therapy that would be effective, it'd be like forcing you to <laughs> actually be inside your head for extended yeah. periods of time and in different situations. Like and social then, isolation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's working out well. But yeah, it's like uh, um, it's funny because I just saw in my rearview mirror here um, something that actually this is a really it's a very beautiful. Uh, I'll show you. Hold on, it's a very beautiful piece called uh, it's called Lost uh, a Loss. But it's by this guy Miles. Um, oh wait, where's my camera? There, there we it is. go. Yeah, um, it's just this really like dark and beautiful oh. idea of loss. And I, this is how I look at my my life. Wow. My relationship with with OCD, I guess you know, and and everything else associated with it. Um, wow. As it was a drawing, and then this company created a uh, like a I think I don't know if it was three D printed or whatever, but they created like um they started doing like sculpture versions of it, and then all these artists like came on and like started doing like flowers and mushrooms and crazy shit. But um, but I think like this is what OCD is to me. It's like not ERP, you know. Oh, that makes me want to tear up. So I'm not going to look anymore. <laughs> I think it's another conversation. Another, we should do another fireside chat at some yeah, point. Yeah, because I've got, I have a lot of very dark art that makes me feel good. Well, so when I see that, um, we're, we're going to have to end here in just a minute. Um, on, we'll have to, we'll have to figure out how to end on hope. Remember? Um, we don't do but, that. <laughs> um, when I see that sculpture, and also, um, oh, I might, I, I probably shouldn't even talk about it because I feel like I'm going to get emotional. Um, it just feels like, uh, you know, how I don't even know how to let go of OCD almost. Like, yeah. it's so part of me and it, it, it helped shape who I was. And so if I think about like holding it and letting it go, that's exactly what it would look like. And yeah. isn't that confusing? Like, why wouldn't we want to let OCD go? It's such a awesome you're letting thing. go a part of you. Exactly. So um, on Fine. that note, we should close up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's end on tears. Um, Let's do the art episode because um, because I actually really, uh, what I would tease out is I realized like most of the music and the lyrics that I listen to are actually co compulsive in nature mm, because the lyrics too. themselves are very existentially pro provocative and they, they are um, trying to get me to achieve a level of certainty in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I listen to techno, but techno has great lyrics. Y'all, y'all just don't know if you don't listen no, don't give do me that face. Say, I just saw that you went. Do do people still say techno? I thought it was EDM. Also, it's Molly, not ecstasy. Now, just so you, you know, know what? I am not a hipster. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll do an art. We'll do an art episode. Okay. <laughs> that that right. turn in an emotional way. I did not want it to for me, but I'll send um, you the photo of the artist. He's super cool. He is very oh, beautiful. Stuff. I love that. Okay, so at OCD Game Changers, one of my favorite parts of the entire day was when you were doing your speech. And I was like, Aaron, end on a hopeful note. Yeah, and then you would like rant again. And I'd be like, Aaron, hopeful. Yeah. Well, the thing is, like, I think if you're being real about advocacy. I know. I wasn't disagreeing. I was just, you were closing, you just I mean, you were closing out the whole day. So I was like, let's yeah. just. <laughs> I won't be brought back again. Dude, yeah. I loved it. It was like my one of my favorite things of the whole day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, um, how can we end? Like, tell us, tell us um, a message. I don't care if it's real or hopeful. Like, just tell us something. Just give us, yeah, give okay. us your thoughts. Uh, this is wrap it maybe, out. I mean, 
you know, not in any way taking away the brevity that we're all experiencing firsthand with people losing their lives and people that I know um, being in life battling situations and also not taking for granted um, the fact that people are losing their jobs and um, going to continue to lose their jobs for a while. It's going to be really rough and people are going to have to scrap and fight and try to find ways to pay bills and um and not get the support they they need from the government and that's just a fact i think so uh in light of that we at least in the ocd world we do have a little edge on on people because we've dealt with so much uncertainty that i think we can i liked your trampoline thing earlier uh oh, i'm gonna yeah. write that down i like the trampoline thing and i liked the it's scarier when we think that we're capable of doing something versus when we're just reacting to things happening to us. That's That was a great one. I have it written down already. Hmm. There we go. It's going to be tips from Aaron Harvey. Deep so, thoughts by Aaron Harvey. Deep thoughts. Yeah. Deep thoughts. Uh, so my, my final thoughts are, um, I always love talking to you. I feel like we could do like a fireside chat, chat for like five hours. <laughs> I'm sure it would be enthralling. <laughs> Um, to the listeners out there, thank you for being here with us. I know we, we went across all of the spectrums, um, but I hope that anything that we said could help normalize what you're experiencing right now. Cause, um, you know, to again, repeat what Natasha Daniel said earlier, there is no right way to feel, which means there's also no wrong way to feel. So whatever you feel, just feel it and feel through it. And the point of doing these chats is to help you know that we're here walking alongside you while you feel it. We don't want you to walk alone during this time because all of us feel scared and uncertain. But it, like to echo what Aaron said, we we do have that leg up, some resilience, but that doesn't necessarily shield us from real emotion. And so I just want you to know, um, for me, um, I'm scared. I feel uncertain, but I pull and draw off of my experience with OCD and know that I have been again at rock bottom before and I have risen from that and so can you and all of us can so you know for me and and Aaron thank you so much for being here you know I love you to death and you're one of my favorite people um (laughs) and we'll do this again I appreciate you being here um and from all of us at OCD Game Changers um, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our last fireside chat of the week. Angie Alexander and I are going to come on and talk about peer support and how important nice. it is during this time. Cool. Red. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for being here and I will see you tomorrow at 7 PM Eastern standard time, 5 PM mountain standard time. And um, yeah, you were not alone and we love you.